Galaxy of Film presents. Let's fucking go! Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to a very special episode of the LFG Podcast. This is Brady Messina, film editor for Galaxy of Film. And joining me for this special episode is our director of fan relations, Shamim. What's up, Shamim? How are you doing? Good. I'm, I'm good. I just, um, I'm really excited to get, getting down to the barrel of paint and seeing what strokes come out of this fun interview. And, but, Glad to hear that. What did Bob Ross say? Um, Glad we was joined here today. Why yes. Enjoy us painting with Britt McAdams. <laughs> Go, ahead. Go ahead, Brandon. All right. Um, yeah, Shamim, I'm going to be a bit uh, honest here. I am a little nervous headed into this episode because uh, for our special edition of LFG, uh, we have a very special guest joining the two of us here. Uh, he is the director of 2023's Paint, starring Owen Wilson, Mr. Britt McAdams. How are you doing, <laughs> Britt? Good to have you here. I'm good. How are you guys doing? I'm doing great. Okay. Any uh, any exciting plans you had today? Anything uh, ex- you know interesting? The only exciting thing was just at the very beginning before we started recording, there was an earthquake here. I'm in Los Angeles. So they're saying it was a 4.7, but it felt stronger. Wow. And oh, maybe wow. I oversold it. Maybe I oversold it on the on the call, but it felt <laughs> it felt big. Um, so hopefully, you know, we just uh, we just this last week we had our we had ten inches of rain here, and we had a you know just we had a couple houses across the street from us condemned from a mudslide. So we're having a I'm not sure exactly what we're doing wrong in Los Angeles this week, but we're paying for it. So uh, yeah, I don't know. I just I don't know. I don't know where exactly I think, but I hope people are okay. Yeah, I, I mean, it's very, I just can't even imagine what, like, you guys are going through right now with all the, you know, earthquakes that you have over here. Um, I know being in Michigan, like, all we get is just pretty much snow, um, and then, and potholes pretty much. Uh, <laughs> our, our temperature just fluctuates in Michigan. Like, one day it will be 65 degrees, and the next day it will be, like, 27. So, it's just... <laughs> It's just a constant battle with the weather over here in Michigan, for sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for for this episode, like I said, we're going to be talking with Britt McAdams, uh, discussing his recent movie, Paint, as well as talking about uh, his uh, career in filmmaking from earlier on into present day. Um, but uh, let's cut right into the chase and get uh, to the questions here. Shamim, what, what do you say? Sounds good. Um... The thing, yeah, also, um, so, but this is my Bob Ross answered (laughs) bank check from 1987, March 13th. Amazing. His his handwriting is kind of um, really, really nice, actually. It's beautiful. It is really nice signature. and, that's a and great signature, signature, huh? That that's different from what you see on his paintings, actually. Looks like a thirty-six dollars uh, check. Do you think the Do you think the check is forged? No, it's a cancer paint bank bank check um, from Bob Ross when he used to live in. Uh, are you and, sure you're not? Hold, are you sure you're not holding up a forged autograph nope. there? No, it's right there. Pure DNA. Forged a, autograph. Authenticated. Authentication. All right. Yep. So it's an authentic auto, and this is my only Bob Ross signature in my collection. And and growing up for me, I would say paint. I was big on um, Pete Mondrian, um, Van Gogh, and Bob Ross for my three painters, and that inspired me to. And I enjoyed the scream. And Mona Lisa. I mean, like. So some classic paintings enjoy... right there. Yeah, and then here is a prop 
from the film. Owen Wilson's actual paintbrush. Separate sign for me. Nice. It's actually. I think you've seen this paintbrush in the film, have you? Um, yeah, you can see it's got a little bit of blue on it. From there's a, a a painting of the sky in the at the very beginning, and there's some blue there. Yep. Yeah. So really this is cool. a screen. You. What What happened here? Uh, <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Maybe Ambrosia got a hold Red of it. Red paint and um, <laughs> oh, blood. Whatever happened with their there? UFO painting? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll get right into the questions here, uh, Shamim. Right. Uh, but Brett, let's uh, start with this. Um, can you recall any like early memory of when you first became fascinated with the whole film industry, or anything that drew you in at, um, when you were little? Um, I would say, I think there are for sure lots of moments in there, but I, I think for me, um, uh, one that really sticks with me is when I, it was 1977. And so I was, um, like nine, eight or nine and, uh, my, we went to church and my, we were on our way to church and my, my mom and my dad were like, we're going to go see a movie on the way back from church. And, uh, my sister and I, we never, we went to so few movies. My my parents were super cheap. So um, they were like, we're going to go see a boxing movie. And I was like, oh. Rocky? Yeah. So I was like, that's the last thing I want to see is a boxing <laughs> movie. And, and I came out, we watched it and I loved it so much. And we came out, you know, I was jumping all around and throwing punches and stuff. I, I would say that was, I mean, there are plenty of those moments, like seeing Star Wars with my grandfather in Nashville Tennessee, like at basically the same time, there's sort of those moments that really stick with me. But in some ways, I think it was Rocky because it was like the last thing in the world I wanted to see was a boxing movie. And it was just so good and such a good story and such a good love story and so unexpected. And um, and it's also really stood up well. I think it's a really, um, I, I've learned a lot, a lot, a lot from that film and watching it over the years. Um, so I think that's that was the first one that really stayed with me, I think. Rocky definitely, Rocky definitely sure is a very classic movie um, as part of the upper echelon, I would say, of uh, uh, cinema right there. Um, but yeah, as you're um, pretty much growing up uh, in your in your life, uh, was there anything that kept that uh, drive going as a filmmaker? Any uh, what was your kind of process or the kind of steps that you took? Uh, to get into this film career or to add the uh, the directing credit to your resume? Um, I, nothing specific, honestly. I know that's not the best answer, but my dad is a writer. And so when I was a little kid, he would, he was also a pilot, like he was um, a chief pilot for Pan Am uh, when Pan Am was nice. still. So he was sort of like, he had this career where he was he would fly and then he would go somewhere and write. And he always wanted to be a writer. So he would read to me like in the mornings or before I go to bed, he'd read Plumstock Quarry or these books. Um, he has he has a book that did really well called uh, Bon Courage, which was published a, a few years ago about rebuilding a house in uh, France, like a really cheap house that he and his wife bought for next to nothing and then spent a couple of years fixing up in the how hard it is the language barrier and everything else when you're in a different country trying to uh, build a house. But so I, when I was a little kid, I just loved, it almost didn't necessarily matter what the stories were. It was like hearing my dad's voice and him reading to me uh, what he had written. And um, I, I think between my parents and my mom was a big theater person. And so I had a real appreciation for storytelling that way. And so uh, I think it was, it was it was more the storytelling than anything else. I didn't necessarily think at all that film would be a possibility or that I would I would start ever really shooting stuff. I, I had um, when I applied to colleges, I had my application application essay published in a book on how to write college essays, and that was sort of the first. That sort of became an excuse for me in my early twenties. Like I think it's different now with like like your generation, I think there's less pushback if you try, if you're going to say, I'm going to really take a shot at doing something unusual or exceptional. Sure, and sure. I was a kid, it was much, I'm from New York. So it was like, if you said you're going to be a writer or a director, people would be like, oh, good luck with that. 
So I had sort of this excuse of like, I'd be like, well, I think I'm going to, you know, try and write just because I had my application essay published. So, you know, that feels like something I should pursue. So I could kind of say I wanted to be a writer without it sounding too embarrassing. So um, it was more that I came up in that with the idea of being a writer. And then I got hired at VH1 when I was 22. Yeah, to write, I lucked into writing, getting to write my own quiz show there, um, sort of when they had more of those kinds of shows. So I, I, they mistook me for this other guy who um, I worked at this edit house, like, you know, bringing people food and doing duplications and stuff. Of, and so they got me mixed up with this other guy at this duplication who was the biggest music guy ever. And they got me mixed up with him and they accidentally hired me to write this show. So um, that was sort of my way into uh, writing for TV and stuff. Um, and and eventually just started kind of shooting my own stuff along the way when I was there. But yeah, I don't think I, I don't think I, I mean, I didn't know what directing was for a long, long time. And some would argue I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice to hear. Um, I know Shameen had a question uh, prepped up already. Do you have, what's, what's your question you want to ask Shameen? So Britt, um, since this paint was your first directorial debut, what lessons have you learned from directing this, um, this film and- Well, I, I've definitely learned a lot. Uh, I, I have, you know, I've directed a lot of, uh, stuff before some you know TV shows and I did commercials for a long long time and uh, did a like a full length doc and then did a comedy uh, feature that was with Cat Williams so it's like I've sort of directed a lot of different stuff but um, uh, just the you know with paint I would say as much as anything I think in in paint I the the, my favorite lessons I learned in paint were in a lot of ways um, an affirmation of that you really want to hire good people everywhere. And that's super important. And if you can create a world where people are happy and like working at a place, they'll do a better job. So sort of selfishly, uh, selfishly to take care of yourself, as many good people as you can surround yourself with the the better off you'll be absolutely so we really, yeah so we really fought with for that with all of our when we were casting it we really tried to you know just in casting we would looking at people i would ask a lot like and research people and find out if they were nice people honestly <laughs> and so that that helped with some of the casting decisions everyone we had was really they're just really nice hardworking people like owen is a really good guy He's a really hard worker and he's just nice to people, which I know is like, it's the simplest things that make everything easier. So like we were shooting, shooting during COVID and we just couldn't afford to have anything else go wrong. So part of like, you know, like our cars didn't run like in the movie, like we are, most of our cars didn't run. So, you know, if you're pushing a car next to Owen, and he thinks it's kind of funny as opposed to being mad you're in a good place so yeah uh, you know just that was a big lesson the other i also really liked the the thing i don't place i never i don't think i would have gotten to without covid is um a lot of times especially on the the bigger something is and this is not this was not a big production or a big film um per se but I've certainly done big commercials and stuff where you just have tons and tons and tons of people on set and it's incredibly hard to sort of stay focused on what matters, which is what's you're shooting. So what I liked about filming during COVID was that you, you, we couldn't have many people in rooms uh, just because of the COVID rules. And I just right. really grew to appreciate that where um, the cinematographer is is uh, my old friend, Patrick Cady, who's a much more successful director than I am, which is a smart hire. Um, but so he and I could really just talk without anyone 
you know, just us talk about stuff and make really quick decisions about stuff. And um, it was a very, it was a very easy shorthand where it wasn't like tons of people coming on set to, to in some ways do their jobs, but also kind of keep the production from moving forward. So like, like Christopher Nolan, it has a very, very small set. And, um, and I've learned that that's what really helps me to, to do the best job, uh, where I'm sort of not distracted by who's sitting next to me or who's laughing at the monitor, who's not laughing, who's not laughing at the monitor is really the thing, but it's, uh, it's just easier to streamline it that way. So I think that was, that's something, and it's like anything else, especially with COVID, like, I think COVID, like, uh, we have a, I'm married and I have a 10 year old and an eight year old, and we became much, much closer as a family only because of COVID where we didn't leave the house for a year. And I think it's, you know, that was a real blessing for us. Um, and I think in some ways shooting during COVID really taught me, was able to sort of like af affirm what was important in terms of casting or getting the right people. And also really taught me that I like a smaller set and can do a better job with a smaller set. Going back to um, all your early work, um, was there how much struggles and uh, learning, more learning experiences did you have in like your early part of your career that um, eventually led up to uh, making paint and working around those conditions? And was there anything during your um, early time that helped you um, grow as uh, not only a filmmaker, but also as a person in this industry? Yeah, for sure. I think it's all the mistakes, you know, that's the, so I, I would mm -hmm. say a good for me was when I was like 23 or so, like uh, Lauren Zelaznik was the, um, uh, like the number two person at VH1 and she's a genius and lovely person. She went on to be like president of Bravo and a, and a bunch of channels and stuff. So, um, like she created all the real housewives and really took Bravo to the next level. But so when I, when I worked for her, I sold, like I was in house, but I sold a show, uh, to VH1 where I was the writer, director, producer, and also on air as a interviewing people on air, but it was like a sort of a mockumentary is kind of like a spinal tap kind of thing. Okay. Ooh. And, um, and so I was really young and uh, and she would give me notes and stuff and I wouldn't take them and and I wouldn't back off of me being in charge of so many different things I knew nothing about. And uh, she ultimately pulled the plug on it and she told me I was one of the most difficult people she'd ever worked with. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you yeah, know, that's a good lesson right there. You know, it's like you... I think you hear so many stories about it's like, you know, Steven Spielberg took an office at Universal or wherever. And then, uh, you know, like he sort of took control of his fate by doing that. Or, you know, there are people who don't compromise or and not Spielberg, but there are people who don't compromise or, you know, really stick to their guns on, on stuff. And mm -hmm. um, and there's for sure part of that can help. But a lot of that can also hurt if you're difficult to work with. People don't want to work with you. So that was a really good lesson for me early, just not to be, uh, not to be a jerk. Like, and it was, it's funny, like I talked to her, um, I, I just really appreciate honestly that she said that to me. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, she and I are friends now. Like I, you know, we spoke when this movie came out and uh, uh, I don't know. I think it's like those types of, those types of lessons that like, I think you, so often you get caught up in what you think something should be, or you get sidetracked by thinking you should be a certain way or worrying about things besides making the best possible thing. And uh, once you start worrying about other stuff, that's when you get in trouble. So, um, and, and yeah, just being agreeable and listening to other people take notes. Like that's a big thing as you go along, like the older I get, the more I want to, I want notes from people and I want to change something. I want to change something that doesn't work immediately. Like, I want to hear if something doesn't work, like, tell me like, and, and, uh, you know, people, this is something Bill Hader recently said, but it was like, 
no one will be able to tell you how to fix it, but they can, everyone can tell you, or lots of people can tell you where something's wrong and yes. um, yeah, not to be precious with anything. Press, don't be precious with the scene or anything else. Like if it doesn't work, change it. Um, and, and listen to people and listen to an audience or whatever else. And, and, uh, and and change it if it doesn't work because you'll spend so long not changing something or fighting to keep something and it'll just it'll just kill whatever you're working on so um yeah i think it's just being open to stuff is is i i would say that's like the biggest lesson i've learned over uh over the years i would say other than um paint was there any other um projects that you worked on in your career that you just had an amazing time like on the set or any like anything that like really stood out to you um being in this industry yeah lots and lots of stuff um uh i really like this movie i did with uh with once again that patrick katie it's called trivia town it's about the world's largest trivia contest in stevens point wisconsin it's 450 teams who play for 54 straight hours and that's a that was a fun world of shooting a terrible terrible world of editing because we we shot 450 hours of footage um, oh wow so, yeah that was uh by the end it was like me and a laptop just trying to finish it like just a like that's a no, don't shoot any don't like uh shoot don't overshoot a documentary is another big lesson like don't 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 shoot 450 hours of footage that's another big lesson uh i don't know in general i just like to work like like i don't really i haven't really had many bad experiences working so um i i think for the most part like uh i like creative people like i like being around them i like the energy of it so um uh yeah i don't know i think everything i've worked on i don't think i've never really disliked anything i've ever worked on when was Trivia Town? When was that released, actually? 2000, I think it was 2006 is when it came out. Oh, wow. And there was so much, like, editing. Wow. That's yeah. that's very crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it's so long ago, too. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a great little movie. It's a great little movie. We And that's another, here's, this is what I learned about Trivia, from Trivia Town, was we had two offers to release it. One was from Universal music which was part of universal but it was going to be in stores everywhere mm -hmm. and the other one was uh, media targeting associates gave us an offer and we went with media targeting associates <laughs> and uh and it was a very nice guy who had a an apartment in brooklyn and uh that was the end of he gave us money to finish it which was great which we did need money at the time so it was nice to get some money for finishing the film but uh yeah it was um in a lot of ways and, and we were trying to pay people like you know it's like a lot of like patrick's family had invested in it and stuff so we were trying to like pay people back and sort of make people whole and we just it felt like going with a big distributor we would it would be super hard to ever do that versus versus like a very targeted approach and uh we chose poorly so uh yeah i don't know it's like you know uh nothing like a failure to teach you a lesson i was gonna say like it's better to like treat that as like a learning experience for um later on in life so, yeah absolutely I think, I, I think as much as you can hit like hit a double like doubles are great like mm -hmm. so hit a double you know if you like if you're swinging for the fences is great, but if you can hit a double, you're doing pretty well. So I think that's the other thing there. I wish we would have, I wish we'd been like, this is a solid deal from universal. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. Like I, I think a double, a double is pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's really no shame in like, uh, you know, failure or anything along those lines, just because like you can, I feel that that's like more of just a, a learning thing that you could just grow uh, as a person uh, or just in your career, just like having those kind of stepping stones uh, in order to uh, just reach the highest mountain pretty much is the way I just look at uh, most things. Um, Actually, it's 2006, Brett, for the... For the for Tribute Town? Yeah. 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 That, that's actually the same time period right after comic book movie came out 
uh, in 2004. Okay. So Trivia Town's about going on its 20th, maybe the. It's going to be about 20, I think, this year. That's coming up. 20th anniversary. Almost, yep. almost 20. Coming up. Wow. <laughs> Weird. Time for a Trivia Town reunion. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we've uh, we've all we've stayed in touch with a bunch of the people there. Uh, so it's it's weird, you know, just with like Facebook and social media and stuff. I'm aware of, you know, like someone from the film passed away recently from one of the teams, and one of the one of the guys has gone on to become mayor of the town now, and and you know, it's like now other generations are now playing trivia so it's it's uh, it's sort of ongoing it's a great very specific little world that i love so look you know it's been really nice to sort of stay in touch with people from the film yeah that's great that that seems like out by alley too because i like those kind of like competition style um shows or just like i'm i'm a big board game uh, fanatic so something like that just appeases me is there anywhere that i can like um no nope. perhaps no <laughs> like that's uh it's and it's the <laughs> it's such a bummer i would say we, like the producers there are three of us and you know like once a year we'll be like because we'll get asked about it and the problem is it's like re-clearing all the music because the music wasn't cleared for internet. It was cleared for like, you know, DVD for X amount of years and whatever else, but it's like, okay, it was before that. And it's sort of, at some point it needs to happen. And also it's, uh, we would, if we can't, like there's a Jack Nicholson clip in it. There's some, like there's stuff that was cleared for limited amount of time and the, it getting back into all of that stuff just always makes people tired. Like when we start talking about it, it's like, so we'd have to replace this, all this Louis Prima music or like it's the music you'd have to replace, da, 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 da. And then, you know, people who everyone's got paying jobs and stuff. So everyone's sort of like, mm -hmm. well, if anyone wants to do it, go ahead and do it is kind of, <laughs> and also the problem is it's like the software that we cut it on. It's like, it's the, it's like Final Cut 6. So like, uh, you know, it's even that, like it's like getting old stuff to like boot up is, uh, is hard so yeah some uh, at some point there'll be a copy for you i you know i say for sure i'd love to have one especially um i wanted to start like a dvd collection soon so if you any chance like there's like a new cut like definitely send a copy my way for sure all right all right any final questions for you shamim about his uh, oh yeah um life? let's see okay um when you were growing up, who was your artist inspiration that helped you create paint? Like uh, paint artist. Uh, I mean, Bob Ross, you know, like it's, which yeah. is sort of the obvious answer, but I mean, I grew up loving Bob Ross. I love the power that he had over people. I love that as, you know, as a little kid, you would, you'd sort of see him on TV and you'd sort of be like, oh, who's this guy? You know, like, cause he was so different. And then you would just get quiet and, and he would just take you into a whole different world. And it was this really peaceful, tranquil, amazing place because what he was generating was something you just never saw anyone else do. And you'd be transfixed and the world would be sort of quiet and peaceful and kind and full of possibility. And, mm -hmm. and then his show would end and the world would get loud and you just kind of wish you could go back to that place. So that specific vibe was was um it's so unique so that was uh yeah I just I just always liked that place as a kid when I was a little kid so um yeah for in terms of for yeah for artists it's definitely it's it's the man himself I know have I know you for got, sure. oh go ahead have you, ever got, have you ever gotten the chance to meet Bob before he passed or now no not at all um and in a lot of ways uh just so the movie would sort of be its own thing. I I did not research him. Or I really tried to stay away from him specifically, like making the film. So, um, you know, I've had a lot, a lot of Bob Ross people reach out to me um, since the film's come out, you know, like um, uh, people affiliated with him and, and stuff. So um, I'm, I'm much more aware of that world now. And it's, 
in a lot of ways, it's not the, you know, there's some animosity there between people, and which is sort of a bummer that there's this whole other side to Bob Ross that isn't sort of as pure as he seemingly was, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, you sort of wish the world wasn't that way. And everybody just sort of had nice things to say about each other. Um, but uh, yeah, so yeah, it was, it was, yeah, for sure, Bob Ross as a kid. So that's what inspired you to make this film pretty much, right? Uh, yeah, I just like the, well, yes. And then a big part of it w was that when I was, um, when I was young, as I've said, I worked at VH1 when that was a big music channel. I mean, it's very different than it is now. It was MTV and VH1, and they were, you know, the same company and stuff. But so I would, I met a lot of famous artists back then, and I did promos, and I would end up asking a lot of famous people to do stuff they didn't want to do. And um, it was a bummer because a lot of my favorite people who I grew up loving as artists were pretty crappy. So um, I would say in general, all the hard rockers were really nice. Like it was like, it's funny how it was like anyone who like rocked was nice. Anyone who was like uh, a storyteller or someone who had some something, some significant message was in a lot of ways, not as nice. So this, the thought was um, basically I was very aware of also who I was as a kid, but if you became a star at 22 would you how hard would it be for you to move on from that if you thought you had the world figured out at 22 and the world kept telling you you had the world figured out for the next 20 or 30 years would you ever evolve beyond who you uh were at that age and for the most part i don't know you know if if you're a very successful person at that age there's there's a good chance. <laughs> I don't know. You, you could just be horrible. You could be horrible and you'd never change. So that was a big reason uh, for paint was sort of being around people who people have been telling them they were great for too long. And in a lot of ways, I think that's a big part of life. It's like, if you don't suffer, if you don't go through horrible stuff, it, it's really hard to learn empathy. And it's really hard to be, I think it's hard to be a good person if everything's handed to you. That was a big part of the film was this idea that, you know, Carl Nargle, who Owen plays, he's been the cock of the walk his whole life. And so why would he ever change? Why would he ever grow beyond that? Um, so, yeah, it's sort of, you know, it's a combination of loving Bob Ross as a kid and then and then being in a world where a lot of people I really would have loved to look up to were just not who I wish they had they, they, I wish they were. Continuing on with uh, paint, actually, um, having like looked up paint um, as uh, before this interview, I noticed that uh, your screenplay for paint was a part of the 2010 blacklist for um, all the you know big screenplays uh, that were like hot at the time. Can you just um, kind of describe what the blacklist really is and how much how, or how important it is to be on that you know huge list so the blacklist is like a list of the the best or you know most highly regarded unproduced screenplays for a for each year so paint sort of snuck on the blacklist in 2010 like i wrote it it was done in like october and the blacklist comes out in november so there wasn't really it was we got really lucky to get on it just because, you know, scripts had to come out, you know, 10 months before or whatever, had a lot more people reading it, uh, reading them and stuff. So we sort of were really lucky to sneak on to the blacklist. And the what the blacklist does for you is, and I had an agent tell me this, not my main agent, but a, another agent. She said, because paint took, you know, effectively 13 years to get made and mm -hmm. we were greenlit to get we were greenlit to get made about two, uh, a few weeks after I wrote it. So it was super fast. And then it just fell apart for a decade. And so, um, which is not that unusual either, which is tragic. But uh, I had this one agent say to me, the, for the most part, what happens with screenplays with agents is that an agent will read your screenplay and 
do his or her due diligence, uh, do their di their due diligence, and pass it along to production companies, whomever, and then you'll hear back that people don't really like it, and then it just goes away. And that's just the nature of it. Like if you have an if you have an agent for starters, which is you know obviously a hard thing to get, but it's like that's that's just the way it works. Most screenplays die. So she said, with paint, people really like the screenplay, and that's why it's it's not going away. Like that's why it keeps coming back, and that's why people keep wanting to get it made. And I and and I don't you know part of that was being on the blacklist where you could always it's almost like when I say like. I could I could say, oh, I want to be a writer because my application essay got published. There was always like this, well, it's a screenplay and it's on the blacklist. So you could just sort of throw that in and be like, you know, it, it sort of immediately, you know, uh, made it something that, of, you know, it, there was value with that. So, um, you know, that, that uh, I, it probably doesn't get made if it's not on the blacklist also, I would say, like, it, I, I think it would, it would have gone away. Like people would have had less faith in it over that decade. If you, if you didn't have that reminder, um, that is, that it had been on the blacklist even a decade before. So it was for sure, you know, there's so many, it's so, so hard to get a film made, um, that there, then there are all sorts of reasons for it to fall apart. So I do think if it wasn't for the blacklist paint doesn't get made, I would, I would think. Of course. And obviously with that 10 to 13 year gap in between all the um, neglections and all the kind of like tossing around um, from different produ producers, um, I was curious how much of an effect it did have on you as a person. And uh, was there any like big takeaways that you took from having like something happen to you? Yeah, I mean, it's really the heart. It's you. uh you know, I signed deals like, you know, right when it came out that were great and those all just went away. So, um, uh, that's hard. And it, you know, it's like, it, it's embarrassing when you're like, you know, people are like, how's paint going? You'd be like, great. <laughs> you know, like mm -hmm. you've been asking me that question for eight years, you know, like, so, uh, a big part of that was also just figure out how to get it made. Like, there was a big snow scene in paint for about a decade. And um, there was a big, uh, it was a big, a, a big scene with like a big, um, big stunt and really expensive. And it was just a page long, but every year it was like, well, we didn't get financing set up for this winter. So we'll do it next winter. And then at one point, um, uh, Mike White and Dave Bernad were producers on it for a long time, for you know, seven years or something. And, you know, Mike White is White Lotus, and Dave Bernad is. Um, I mean, his latest thing was Jury Duty, not Jury Duty, but is that what it's called, Jury Duty, the TV show? But it's great. I think but, right. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, which is great, which is a great show. And then Mike's obviously a genius, but um, so like Bernad, uh, Dave was like do you really need the snow scene? Cause it's, it kills the movie when we try and get it made every year, basically. And I said yes for years because I didn't want to rewrite a one page scene. Like, and it was a great scene. It was really fun, but ultimately I rewrote it in a day. And with a scene that I think ultimately does more for the film and moves the film forward instead of this big stunt. And I was just so, stupid and lazy about not wanting to change a page that that probably cost it years of getting made I, I it's like you just have to figure out how to get stuff made is the thing um so um listen to notes listen to what people say and then be a rat to the cheese like mm -hmm. just like figure out how to get something made and don't create your own roadblocks and if someone has a way to do it then do that because it's just too hard. Of course. Um, and, you know, like you said, you know, you were filming during um, COVID when the production of paint started to um, finally develop um, and how you were talking about your um, rewriting uh, as the, like, the massive gap was going on too. Was there anything else that 
um, that co when COVID happened, was there anything that you had to rewrite or had to restructure for the film due to these COVID uh, restrictions? Uh, we just, COVID was hard. COVID was like, a, it was like having a whole nother department, you know, like your camera department, art department, whatever else. It was like just the amount of money that went to COVID and the amount of time we spent each day dealing with COVID and, you know, just like lunch got much more expensive and no one could sit next to each other. And so it just robs you of a lot of money. <laughs> so, yeah. and, and we shot the film in 20 days, which is really, really quick. And, uh, you know, our days were 10 hour days with travel. Like, so we, our days just kept getting compressed. So, uh, we cut scenes, we just cut and we cut some scenes. I, you know, big fun scenes that I liked. Um, I mean, there was one big scene where Carl Nargle is when he's, when things are going really bad for him, he's, uh, he ends up plowing driveways, uh, uh, to support himself. And he puts a plow on the front of his van and there's a scene where he has a flat tire and he's changing it. And it's a snowstorm and an 18 wheeler drives by and plows him under and with uh he ends up like turning and looking he's got snow all over his face like with his afro and and i know it's a laugh i know it's a fun scene but it was like one of those things where it was like looking at the schedule and it was like oh we have two hours to shoot all of that in this day and it was like that's gonna take that's a day like to shoot that it's at least a half a day to shoot it, it was like we can't do it it was just like like covid made just made us practical about stuff. And so, but there were like sort of jokes, there were jokes that we lost just because COVID was costing time and and uh, had, you just had to make decisions about stuff. Um, so yeah, COVID, uh, COVID wasn't all good. <laughs> I mean, which is, I mean, in terms of like, I mean, COVID was horrible, but it, right. you know, since I learned from COVID, it's certainly now looking back, it's like, oh, it would have been fun to shoot some stuff that we had to drop. Absolutely. I mean, and definitely COVID took a hit on the entire film industry when it was like at its like peak and, um, you know, in its restrictions and what you can actually do on uh, sets and production. Um, but I, I totally respect you for still putting in that work and, you know, turn out like the best movie that you could um, because of those restrictions. So I definitely like, I have to applaud you for that, uh, for sure. Um, Shamim, what other questions do you have for Brett about the movie? Um, about the movie, um, if you, uh, when cast, when you, when, when you did cast, um, her, um, who was your, um, first choice to play Carl if Owen, or Owen didn't take the part? Who would you like? It would have been me, obviously. <laughs> Step in there. Like, that guy gets so much credit. Um, no, uh, if it wasn't no, Owen, I mean, no one. No, no one. I mean, back in 2010, when you wrote the, written the script, who did uh, you envision playing Carl? Um, I, I, will, I will say, I will... I will say I could not have been luckier to have Owen do the part. And I would say that um, I had, I didn't ever think he would be available to do it. Um, and so I could not be luckier than to have him. Uh, yeah, have him your car. I mean, like bef before Owen, did, did, did you have like, do you remember um, there's this um, rap battle, um, epic rap battles of history, where sure. Nice Peter played Bob Ross as yeah. a rap battle? Would you ever thought of Nice Peter being called? No, I would have gone. I would have gone with Lloyd Olquist, the underrated <laughs> rap battles. How could you not choose? How could you not choose Lloyd? I'm surprised. I'm surprised you like like know who Epic Rap was. Like that was my like childhood growing up. You wouldn't go with Lloyd. <laughs> um, uh... so, I mean, so you know, maybe Carl as Peter and Lloyd as the um the head of the network or something. That'd be fun. Don't minimize Lloyd. Give him give him the 
give him credit. He deserves the credit. Yeah. He's half. Of, he's half of that team. Yeah. Well, Ooh. let me. I'll, I'll answer that. So here, this is my answer. So my answer is that I was incredibly lucky to have all of these guys. So, like every single actor who was in paint, um, I could not have been more fortunate that, than to have those guys doing it. So um, that is the dream team. The dream team is what you see on the screen because it's- So uh, Owen is your Bob Ross, basically. He's he's my everything. Like he's, he's <laughs> I mean, like what he brings to it is incredible. And also what he brings to it, not just as, a, not just as an actor, but like that guy's a really talented writer. So it's, you know, just going through the script with him like and and just reading okay, it. Okay, so so what what was his first reaction of the script when you first showed him it in uh, that the he um, first it. draft? Uh, well, I just I just heard that he liked it, you know. So I heard, which was great to hear. And then I went and uh, met with him, and he and I are the same age, and he and I have a lot of similar references. And um, wow. So it was just, there was just a shorthand there um, of, uh, of, yeah, we just, there's just a, 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 there's just a natural shorthand there in terms of how we spoke and what we understood and a lot of the, a lot of similar references and um, yeah. And in terms of the, in terms of the script, um, it was just, you know, like in terms of they're just little things, you know, little things that, that got better along the way with him. Um, he, you know, he would just call out anything that felt false or pushed or whatever. Um, so I, I would say, you know, he's just one of those people who made every little part of it better um, because he is, I mean, he's gifted in, you know, in, you know, comedically and as an actor and as a person, like very, you know, he's a, he's gifted, but he's, uh, you know, as a writer, he's, he's great. You know, he's a really, really, he doesn't, write as much as he used to really, but you know, with, it was, you know, he and Wes Anderson were writing those movies, you know, those movies early on, you know, um, and he brings a really unique energy to the world, which is that, you know, in the world of improv, there's a yes and, and so uh, that's what the rules of improv are. It's, it's yes and you don't deny um, something and that's how it's something builds. And I think he sort of brings that energy to everything of like, this is going to get better. Like, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm not going to deny you this thing. I'm going to build on it and make something worse or better, like in the most interesting way. So that was, uh, I don't know, just very lucky to have him. And uh, actually continuing on with Owen Wilson, like just having like a, a big name like that, just attached to your movie, how much uh, confidence uh, would you say as a director you had from having a big name like that? And uh, did that uh, impact in any way on how you approached and directed uh, paint? Uh, no, I mean, you just try and do the best job you can. And, um, but, you know, once, once again, in this whole world, it's like you really try and have nice people. So, uh, you know, you just try and have as many nice people working on something as possible. And Owen's a nice guy. So, I would say in a lot of ways with Owen and everyone else working on it, that was a lot of, a lot of people who are famous don't necessarily want to be, they don't want to be famous. They don't want to talk about being famous or whatever. Like, yeah, you know, they want to talk about whether or not Ulysses S. Grant was a drunk, you know, like, <laughs> well, you know, it's like, it's, you know, it's like life. It's a good question. Yeah, thank you. Like life gets, I mean, like life gets pretty boring if you're famous and you talk about you being famous all the time. Like yeah, that's got absolutely to be terrible. So, you know, a lot of people like Stephen Root really likes American sedans. So he could talk about American sedans a lot. You know, it's like people want to be people. And uh so I think that's also the thing with with you know, people who are famous. It's there's a good, if they're nice people, there's a good chance you're really going to bore them talking about themselves a lot. Um, so it's, you know, people, everyone, everyone has struggles. It doesn't matter if you're rich or famous or whatever, everyone has struggles or things where they're not confident about things or whatever else. 
So it's any any way you can humanize any interaction or whatever, it that makes the world uh, more interesting and and a film set just a, a, a I think a better place to a better place for work and to live and everything else. So um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's also where I think for me it's like and once it, going back to like where I started at VH1, we would have like and you guys are since you guys are just kids you won't even know who these people are but it'd be like tom bosley who was the dad in happy days would like be there and i'd get nervous talking to him because it was like if someone was a star from your childhood or whatever especially if it's like specific to you then you that's who i'd get i'd be like holy cow it's kind of like Cutting. starstruck right yeah starstruck by by that by like in some ways it's those and it's like it's so funny how it's like a lot of like smaller people who are specific to you that's when that's when you can get starstruck by people um, <laughs> um what what was your favorite color painting that was painted by car and do you still have it um i i do have paintings um uh i think my i have a bunch um I like the when he paints the rooftops um, and he paints the chimneys in one, which is his the village he painted for his first date with Catherine. Um, I, I like that one a lot because it's it's such a pure moment for him. So I like what's attached to it emotionally. Um, I like the one where he he paints the giant tree that is um, he's really worried about worried about being too phallic that, that he's going to get a lot of calls at the station. I just like how stupid that joke is. Um, I would say my, I really love the ambrosia painting, which is, I know it's just blasphemous. Um, but I like the, the, the spaceship covered in blood painting. That's the one that's in our living room. Um, uh, so that's, uh, nice. that, that one has some glow in the dark paint on it. Um, oh, cool. Yeah. So it's kind of fun at night. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I like, I, uh, I, I like them all. It's funny. The one that's in the, um, the one that's in the poster is not really doesn't really play, but it it pops well in the poster. It's um it's one from uh the paint off, but it's not really a necessarily an important painting in the film, but it's it's become the film in the poster. So for um out of all the paintings, which one did Owen take? He, Owen has zero of the paintings. Um Aww. I know, mm. I know, and it's like because it things just got. I, I, I need to bring him. Trust me, I need to bring him a painting. It's like I also have a lot of paintings of Michaela <laughs> that I need to bring to her, and I just like I just kept not connecting with her. Uh, and she and I actually were texting a couple of days ago. She has this really great looking movie coming out called Sue's. Look up that trailer, man. It looks really, really good. Oh, I think I've heard of that movie. It's like the trailer just uh, just came out a couple of days ago, and that movie looks great. I I I'm, I have such high hopes for her in that film. Um, she's a delight. So, wow. Um, so, um, but for what props did you take from the film? If you still got besides what you gave me, this. Um, I have stuff. Uh, I, I, I have one van, uh, parked in a, in a, <laughs> in a barn in Vermont. Uh, and I have the van. So the, the license plate of the van is P A N T R in the film. Yeah. Uh, I actually have it registered with that actual plate in Vermont. So like, it's really registered with that plate, which is pretty awesome. My sister lives in Vermont. So she and her husband didn't uh, take care of the van. They'll like turn it around and like get it running, you know, every couple of months. So I don't really know what I'm gonna do with the van. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't have a plan for the van. I have had some, uh, uh, there's a guy who, uh, uh, has, uh, some sort of, uh, marijuana distribution company who would really mm -hmm. like it for his company. So uh, I don't know. That's may maybe it'll end up there. I don't know. It's hard. It's hard to let go of some stuff. Okay. What about um, who has Owen's outfit? Uh, I have. He has a bunch of those. I have like. I have like one. Like um, that one. I think he's got that shirt. He definitely took some shirts and stuff. Um, what uh, about the pipe? The pipe. I have the pipe. 
Um, what about the um, wooden paint thing? Do you have that one? Uh, yeah, I the, have that. Um, this thing, and then the black. Yeah, I have so, the palette. Like I have some palettes. Both yeah. palettes, and he has the pipe. He has the the wig. You got the wig. I have. There's a wig that needs to get sent to me. A wig got lost. Um, uh, oh no. Yeah, a wig got lost. And it was also, this was a really smart thing that production did. So production told me that there are only two wigs and uh, and we wrecked one of them with paint. And then and then we were also doing like extra like shoots promoting the film. And it was like, holy cow, we're missing the wig. It's And I, I have no idea what happened to the one I had. I, I don't know what happened. Maybe so the something. one that's painted in green? Um, yeah, so not that. One, <laughs> but they 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 lied to me, and there are actually four wigs. So uh, I thought there were only two. So that's really smart. That's smart of production. Um, I was very careful with the wigs, not to not to wreck them. Um, actually, uh, too going back with your um, with the production stuff, like uh, I remember you saying that you wanted to keep it as like positive as you can be, like everything, like try to upbeat and uh, just. Go along with the ride, pretty much. Um, was there any other uh, stories uh, during production that that you just had like a blast, uh, or just remember like just having a fun time with? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was just straightforward. Is, here's the deal: like, I, I'm not, I'm not fun. Like, in terms of like, I don't. In like, all, all I do is work. And so that's it. And that's all I want to do. And so like every moment I enjoyed, I, I enjoyed every moment of shooting. Like I enjoyed like the car is not running. And, uh, you know, I enjoyed when it was like that, the van, the production, someone in production slammed the, the door on my hand, the, of the orange mm -hmm. van. And I dropped to the ground holding it and, and said something to the effect of someone find my finger, which really, really freaked out the AD, Jake, and <laughs> my hand was fine. Cause it was like an old American car. So like the the seams weren't even close. Like, you know, you could put your elbow in, in between the door, you know, the doors of that thing and, and you wouldn't get hurt. So, you know, if it was a new car, I would have lost a finger, but uh, that was fun freaking out Jake, the AD, when I dropped to the ground there. But, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, it was fun, like driving around in the back of that van with Owen driving and a bunch of us just on the floor there, like calling out, you know, stuff for him to do or, um, but we were really tight for time and we have very few takes of stuff. Um, I would say Lucia, uh, Lucia who plays Beverly, I would say one of the fun things in there was um, Jenna's played by Lucy um, and Lucy is, uh, she's Australian and really uh, funny wonderful person but lucia would say incredibly incredibly foul things to her before takes and then lucy would break so um that was uh fun to find out what horrible things lucia had said to her after takes um but uh you know it was just like it was we were just moving we were moving fast and and uh so yeah i don't think and nothing really horrible happened nothing really broke or um yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, it'd snow like I, the there's a scene in the intersection where Owen sort of has a where Carl Nargo has a super fan pull up next to him and it snowed for half of that scene. So we had to add snow and post for the other half of the scene. Like that was pretty There's like a snowstorm on one shot and then the other shot has no snow at all. So we we're lucky enough. Peter Brandt, who's um, he produced it and also financed it, was great about like just finding money to for special effects and stuff. Um, but uh, in general, the whole production was, it was it was great that way. Like there was nothing horrible um, and everyone was nice. So that was the fun part. Good to hear, good to hear. Um, and I would say overall um, with, the, with your movie paint, what is one thing that you want audiences to take away from this movie? If, they, if you could think of one thing that you want audiences to uh just remember for you know just linger in their mind what what would that be 
if you spend your life trying to paint the perfect picture, you're going to miss the best parts of life. Take the filter off of Instagram. Be kind to people. Laugh at your friends, no matter what ridiculous stuff they're doing. Laugh with them. Like, have fun with people. Like, and don't try and be perfect because you're just going to die. So give yourself a break. Like, don't be so critical of yourself. Give yourself a break. Be nice. Don't be a jerk and don't try and be perfect because this is boring also. Like who wants perfect? It's, it's boring. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I know that feeling sometimes for sure. Yeah. Uh, we all do. We all, we all, we are all, all caught up in our own garbage. So mm-hmm. give yourself a break. Be as nice as you be as nice to yourself as you would be to anyone else. Like, like that's how, that's something my wife says. My wife's much smarter than me. So, uh, if you're if you're beating yourself up, just be as nice as you would be to how uh, you would be to someone else. So I, it's just, yeah. If you if you if you try and paint the perfect picture, you're gonna miss the best parts of life. Any any other projects that you're working on? Actually, any any talk future about. things that you have an I- idea for? Oh, just um, uh, I'm uh, I, I have a couple of a couple of uh, show pilots I'm gonna take out and something i'm working on with owen that i really like so um so yeah we'll see it's it's been a weird year with the strike with things sort of coming back from the strike right now so it's uh, um i'll have a better answer next week (laughs) so i so i should i say goodbye to you guys while you do the outro or Uh, uh, i'll just have uh i'll just ask you um where can our followers find you on social media uh any place you want anything you want to promote before you head out of here uh I would say it's I'm just Britt McAdams at, on Instagram and uh no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really have anything. <laughs> you're good, you're good. Um so Shamim, real quick, um any other any other news that you want to share about your uh documentary film, The Autograph King coming out? So the pretty much um the biggest show I would say we friend of mine I have in the film so far is Rain Wilson. We just interviewed him at Fan Expo Portland 2024. That was a pretty cool event. We had um, Emily Swallow from Man Lion Mail. We had, um, like, we had um, the voice of Dora, um, Kate Kathleen Hurlis there. We had um, Tim Jacobus, who was the Goosebumps illustrator there and then we had my friend Cezo the No Drama Llama. It's an actual llama who um his message, my friend Larry and his and his llama's message is like hugs and free selfies and free hugs. He he's like in Jefferson. He does all the Cezo has about twenty K followers on Facebook just for a llama. Can you believe that? Yeah. And then so pretty much um, rains a lot. We we're, we're also going to have a another shot at getting Mark Hamill to come on the film. Oh, cool! And we're actually working on getting Mark, Weird Al, and uh, RJ Mitty. So right now Scott's working on getting these those three, but we currently have Weird Al's drummer John Bermuda Schwartz in the film. And pretty much that, um, as of right now, we're doing editing phase that by May 2024 in the new trailer will be done by next week, Monday, out by next Friday, pretty much. Um, and then pretty much that, and then after that, we're going to start marketing it with Scott's connections he has. And then we have um, Debbie Derry Berry, the voice of Jimmy Neutron in it. We have oh, nice. Roger Rose from VH1. We have um, Darren Norris, who's the voice of um, uh, Cosmo in The Bill and Our Parents. We have the writer, producer of Jingle All the Way, Randy Cornfield. Do you remember him, Britt? He he was like he his his family uh, is the corn cornfield 
like that. Um, he's in the film. He's the one who wrote Jing All the Way. That's and great. With, with the director of Brian Levent. Have you met, met Brian? Have you met Brian, Brian at all? No. So pretty much, and and that, and then we have also the the voice and actor of Jing All the Way, um, Daniel Roden, in it as well. So and so that's where things are with the film. And you can find me on the Galaxy of Films um, Facebook group as Adman. You can find me in Thomas and Nicholas's. Um, um, group. You can find me on Facebook. You can find me on Instagram at Shamim's Autographs, and you can find me at um, TikTok on um, as the Autograph King. And that's what, and you can find me on Galaxy of Films um, website to learn more about me in the film. The trailer is the old trailer is on Scott Zachman's YouTube page under the Autograph King. And lastly, Brandon, go ahead. Yeah, that's me. Um, as for myself, uh, you can follow me on Facebook and on Twitter slash X on at Brandon M226. And you can find me on Instagram at BeLion2K24. Uh, and pretty much all the social media, I, I'm on it pretty much. Uh, you can follow Galaxy of Film on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, um, also, uh, TikTok, we're also on there. Uh, be sure to uh, follow us on those. Be sure to just subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, Galaxy Film Productions, where we have a ton of our uh, video essays and short films that we've done, like Distinguish, Novex, Like a Surgeon. Um, all of those are on there. You can also find some of our past live streams that were recorded. Um, all of that content will be on our YouTube channel, be sure to, to subscribe for that. Um, also, uh, we have a website, so galaxyfilm.com. You can look up all of our portfolios, and pretty soon we will be offering some videography services. So if you're in need of any wedding or concert videographers, anything along those lines, be sure to contact us for that. And, um, and then, once again, oh, yes, Jimmy. And then once again, we're so glad you could join us today in this hour of paint. The director, writer, Brian McAdam. Uh, yeah. Thank you guys so much for paint, having me. Yes, I'd like to paint, thank Paint Brent yourself and... a paint yourself a happy little painting. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> I'd like to thank Britt again for taking the time to come on to this episode to uh, allow us to interview him. Uh, much appreciated, Brett, again. Also be sure to watch Paint if you can. Uh, I, I watched it on Amazon Prime. Uh, you can also watch it on Apple TV, I believe, too, and a right. bunch of other uh, video on, on demand Hulu, services. Hulu, on Hulu, Hulu next yes. month, Hulu, March 22nd for 20 years. Oh, of yeah. Of course. Uh, okay. And I hope all of you guys enjoyed this episode, a very special episode of LFG. Uh, whether you are listening on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or the live version of this podcast will be exclusive to YouTube very soon. Uh, I hope all of you guys have a great rest of your day. Peace out, everyone. Bye.